Hello, good morning, happy Sunday. Welcome to St Peter's Church in Comox. I'm the Rector, Reverend Sue Lynn Milne, and I'm up in the balcony today, so you've got this lovely view of our sanctuary behind me there. Uh, so it's the 29th of January 2023. In church, if you're watching this before a Sunday morning, in church we've got our joint service this Sunday, it's as, as it's the fifth Sunday of the month. Um, and we will be meeting therefore at 9.30 and we'll be having a service together, both of our congregations. So today here online, I'm going to be delivering to you my sermon for this week and it's on Micah chapter 6 verses 1 to 8. So I'll begin by bringing you that reading. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, son of Baal, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil, Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So yeah, so um, I'm looking at that reading from Micah and those last words there are very famous, very well-known words. But you know, I, I've never before really thought about the context in which those words came. So that's what I was doing this week, having a little bit more of a look, about, a look at that. Um, so what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? So the scene that this is placed in is, is kind of like a courtroom scene. God is making a legal complaint against his people. So that imagery sits quite nicely within the wider picture that Micah is painting for us, um, which is about judgment, but hope, threat and yet promise, doom and victory. I don't know if you've ever been taken to court or threatened with it. And I know in North America, especially in the States, apparently they're very litigious there and always taking each other to court the whole time. Um, less so in the UK, but I've seen um, the damage and the pain that people go through when they, um, they are taken to court, when there is a court case against them. Um, whether they're innocent or guilty, it's not a comfortable place to be. Um, and certainly it's a time where you start to look at how, how, you, how are you going to defend yourself, innocent or guilty? You look, look, you look at yourself, you look at your actions. So, um, to hear that God has got a case against you, I mean, that's, that's on another level, isn't it? The righteous God is, is bringing a complaint, a legal complaint against you. So, the lectionary... So the lectionary is, is selective in the readings that it gives us. We follow the lectionary here. So the lectionary reading was Micah 6, verses 1 to 8. So if you read on 9 to 16, then they actually outline all the accusations that God is making against them. But that doesn't seem to concern the lectionary this week. But I will, yeah, I'll touch on that very briefly later on. Um, so the accusations um, are there. But for now, I just want to look at how God approaches the accusation, the, the accusation in general terms, not the specifics. So I'm going to go back and read to you the first couple of verses there. 
Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accu accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. Right. So this is a call to the people of Israel to plead their case. If you get called to a court case, you start to think, what did I do wrong? What can I say for myself? What can they say in their defense? So the witnesses that God calls are strange witnesses. They're inanimate objects. They're things like the mountains. They're the hills. And they're the everlasting foundations of the earth. Strange witnesses in a court case, huh? But not that unusual if you are living in the Old Testament world. Um, if you want to check out Deuteronomy, for example, Deuteronomy 1, where Moses calls the heavens and the earth as witnesses. And Isaiah 1, chapter two, uh, verse 2, um, he calls to their witness the same, the heaven and the earth. He calls them to witness as they, he condemns those who rebel against God. And in Joshua, he, he calls a stone to be a witness against those who are untrue to God. So he sets up a stone as a witness to those who are untrue to God. So the mountains, the pillars of the earth and the hills, they were all there at the beginning. They were there at the beginning of creation. If you turn back to Genesis, you'll see that also. And they were there, therefore, when God made his covenant with his people. Um, when he made that promise and in turn told his people what he expected of them. And then we have the next three verses where God reminds them of his gracious acts. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. And people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gal Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. What have I done to you? asks the Lord. What, how, how have I burdened you, my people? So first of all, I brought you out of Egypt. Good thing, tick. He redeemed them from slavery. That's a good thing, tick. He sent them Moses and Aaron and Miriam. That's another good thing, tick. But then, verse five, remember what Balaam, Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. And remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal. Do you remember those things? <laughs> Do you remember those things? Now, um, I, I didn't even really remember those things. I remembered a, about, a bit about Balak and ba Balaam, but the journey from uh, Shittim to Gilgal, I was like, hey, <laughs> what's that? Can't remember. So I looked it up. Um, but Balak, we know a, bit, a little bit about that, probably remember that because of the, the funny story with the donkey. But Balak um, counseled Balaam to curse, put a curse on God's people for him. Um, but Balaam answered this. He said, how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those the Lord has not denounced? Tick again. That's another good thing. God neither cursed his people nor denounced them. And he protected them from those who sought to do that. Now, that other bit about um, uh, Shittim and Gilgal, that's right. Um, Shittim was the last place that the people of Israel stayed before they crossed over the Jordan into the promised land. And then Gilgal is the first place they stayed after crossing into it. So this journey from those two places was a journey of redemption and restoration and homecoming and protection also, because as the... Um, the river Jordan, the waters were held back. The ark of God was in the middle of the water and it was his presence that kept the water back. It held the water back so it protected all those people as they crossed onto the other side. So that was a good thing too, all those things that the Lord did for them. Now, another little detail that struck me when I was reading that reading about them crossing between those two places um, was when they were halfway there, each um, a representative from each of the 12 tribes of Israel was told to pick up a stone from the middle of the, the water, the Jordan, as they were crossing, and to take them and set them up on the other side. And they set them up 
to the east of Gilgal, if I remember rightly. Um, they set them up there and, and the stones also were to be a sign. They were to be a witness to what God had done, bringing them across at that point of the Jordan to their, the promised land. So there we go, the stones being a witness again, they're coming in there. And then we've got Israel's response, which was this now. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Well, I don't want to get too much into those messianic overtones. I'm sure you notice those for sure, um, of that offering the firstborn for their transgressions. But they're like, okay, may maybe we have to think about what we've done. Um, so what kind of sacrifice would you like from us then to make up from this? You know, we could bring rams and calves and oil and what, what, would, you, what, what, what would you like us to do to kind of make up for all this stuff? Um, it reminded me of that expression, which I hear a bit too often in, in the church. Don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. I won't tell you in what context I keep hearing people say that to me, but um, that's what came to my mind um, here. Don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Um, so what they were kind of wanting to do, well, they, yeah, yeah, we've sinned. Yeah, we, we've kind of done wrong things. And um, yeah, we, we've got to pay a fine now. Um, yeah, what, what can we give you now? What kind of sacrifice can we pay um, for, for doing what we've done. Now, there's nothing there about change. There's nothing there about um, them sensing the call to obedience or to self-discipline um, or to change the way that they live. So Micah points out to them that what the Lord wants from them isn't all the sacrifices. It's not paying the fine. What it is, is to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with their God. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. They come up over and over again in the Gospels. God himself modelled these things. This is about becoming Christ-like. Now, if we were to read those specific accusations that I mentioned to you that are in verses 9 to 16 or thereabouts in chapter 6 of Micah, we would see what the people were doing, and that they were not enacting justice. They were not behaving mercifully, and they were not behaving humbly either, come to that. They were using dishonest scales. They lied and they cheated and they were violent. Change, not sacrifice. Change and not sacrifice is what God required of them. Because God modelled justice and mercy, and thank goodness for the people of Israel that he did too. Micah could assure Israel, because of God's goodness and mercy, that they had hope. A bright future would come and there would be victory for the kingdom of God. It says this later on in the Micah, towards the end of Micah, it says, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives transgression? For 700 years or so after the book of Micah was written, 700 years later, a firstborn son would be offered for our and their transgressions, the fruit of God for the sin of our souls. So it's St. Peter's, I, well, there is, I don't think it was a deliberate echoing of, of Micah, but a year or so ago, we put together a new vision statement, or our first vision statement. Um, and they reflect, they reflect a lot of what we read in, in that chapter there. So our vision statement is this, to reflect the love of Jesus, to be caring, inclusive and just. So I suppose my prayer for us at the end of this sermon is for us to remember that as, as a community together at St. Peter's, that we remember to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God as we follow our own vision for our life in this community. So I've spoken in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lovely to have you join us again this week um, to, to, uh, in the church with this lovely view behind me of the, of the sanctuary. And again, I think I reminded you at the beginning, but if I didn't, um, if you watch this soon enough and you still intend to come to church, it is going to be a joint service because it's the fifth Sunday of the month. We do that on the fifth Sunday. 
Um, so both congregations coming together at 9.30. And it's going to be a bit different this month because the 8.30 people have been working very hard to, to work out or remember how to do a sung morning prayer service. A mm, bit odd for me to do that. It's not something we do really in Wales and I'm at my comfort zone, but it's something we've been doing because we realise we can glorify God through it. <laughs> we'll have a good go at glorifying God through our attempts. So come and support us, please, if you're able to do that and come and join in or, or listen um, to that sung service uh, and pray for <laughs> and pray heartily for us that it goes well. OK, so lovely. And if you can't be in church in person, please keep joining us online. We'll be back again next week with next week's sermon. OK, God bless you. Take care. Bye now.